Discovery, go at throttle up. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to another great episode of Front Row Chaos. My name is Travis Smith, and I am your host. And I am here today with two exceptional young men. One is on the phone with me, and one is actually here in the studio. And today we're going to be talking about what it takes to become a college football player. I know a lot of you out there may have sons that are have that dream or that aspiration to play that game at the next level. And I'm here to tell you what it takes actually i'm not here to tell you my guests are here to tell you what it takes to do that because i don't think a lot of people understand the commitment that it takes and what it takes mentally to play that game at the next level and so i have today in the studio my son brendan smith is here hey how you doing thanks for joining me today son and I, and i know you're off on break for a week because you had to come back here for a few uh, business things that you had to take care of, so I'm glad you stopped by. And I have my nephew, Cameron Carr, on the phone. Hello. Hey, Cam. <laughs> How you doing? Good. How are you? Good, man. I'm glad you decided to join us for this show because I really think it's important for people to understand what it takes to become a college football player. So I have, like usual, a list of questions I'm going to ask you to. And like I said before we started this today, I want you to interject at any time. And uh, we're, we'll kind of go through some of these questions. And that way it'll give the listener some feedback on what they need to possibly do to prepare themselves for such an endeavor after high school. So what we'll do is we'll start off with, Brennan, where did you start playing uh, football. So for me, I grew up, I started playing football at the age of seven, I believe it was. Uh, that was with the Gridley uh, Little League football team, Pop Warner football team. At the time, it was the Gridley Bulldogs, and then we changed the Gridley Titans. A um, lot of kids from around here, if you play football growing up, that's the team you play for. So pretty much from age seven all the way up, I think I took one year off my eighth grade year just before high school of playing football. But every year up until that point I had played, and then going into high school, uh, also played at Biggs High School. What position did you play in youth football? Uh, very first year, I actually started off as a right guard. Uh, then throughout, I would switch. Hey, a right guard. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> the, uh, the subsequent <laughs> years, uh, I played fullback, I played tight end, and then towards the end, my last two years of Titans football, I played quarterback. Cameron, where did you start off, and and where and, and what positions were you at when you started? Uh, I also started playing for uh, Gridley Titans when I was seven, and then I played uh, at Gridley High School for all four years, and um, I played quarterback and receiver a little bit in youth football, and some corner on defense, and then. Throughout high school, I played all quarterback and then corner on defense. So both of you start off in youth football, mm -hmm. and it seems like uh, you, you kind of get your feet wet with what football is like. I specifically remember, remember uh, both of you playing, obviously, and Cameron being in a couple of key big games oh, yeah. that we went and watched, and they didn't go so well as, as Cameron <laughs> wanted them to. Is that correct, Cam? Yeah, definitely not. I'm actually a uh, 0 and 3 in youth football, uh, <laughs> youth football championships. So not exactly the uh, best record on the big stage. Well, that's better than I ever got. I only got to the first round of the playoffs every year. So, <laughs> so hey, so we start off there, and then both of you go to different high schools, and. It seems like you played the same position. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, when I got to high school, I played quarterback. Um, at the time, I wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do going into high school. But uh, I kind of was lucky with the fact that we didn't have an established quarterback going in, and I had that experience. Um, really, at the time, I didn't know that's what I wanted to do going forward. But that freshman year, I felt like I, I really was an amazing athlete, but I had a really good team around us, and it helped me kind of excel. So I was able to play quarterback, do pretty well, and I played quarterback the rest of my high school days. All right. How about you, Cameron? 
Uh, yeah, well, my freshman year I played um, quarterback and uh, corner, and then I tore my ACL and missed my sophomore season. And then um, going into my junior season, I didn't play quarterback the whole year. I played probably like a little over half the season. And Now, why is that, Cam? What happened there? You were just still recovering from knee injury or what? Uh, yeah, I felt I felt like I was I was slow. I didn't move great. And I feel like my knee was still holding me back. And as a result, I feel like I really didn't play. I wasn't great offensively. And I still played the whole time on defense my junior year. But then after I got like a whole nother year, then I played quarterback my uh, my whole senior year and played defense. Now, Cameron, you had the knee injury. How did that happen? Uh, so, yeah, uh, spring of my freshman year. Uh, I'm at a uh, birthday party for one of my friends, and we're playing wiffle ball <laughs> in the uh, front yard. And I'm running to try to get to the brick that is uh, home plate, and I, like, reach out to try and step. And right when I step, I feel kind of like my, my like, knee kind of go to the right a little bit, and my leg kind of, like, oh man to the left. And I feel like a, a big pop, and I just collapsed onto the floor. And it took me a little while before i could get up and like walk and then the next day it was huge so i had to go in and get uh an mri and then i found out that i tore my acl and that i was gonna have to miss my uh whole sophomore year oh man well Well, that sounds like that may run in the family because your uncle had that issue too right yeah yeah he also uh he also tore tore his acl yeah yeah and in fact he tore it in the I think it was in the Gridley game. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think I actually think that is correct. Yeah, I think it was. It was a Gridley Biggs game way back in the day, back in the '80s, that his uh, uncle tore his ACL, which really screwed us up offensively after that happened. But so you got recovered from that, then you start playing really well in your senior year. Yeah. Uh, well, we had a uh, senior year was. Um after covid so we didn't have a full season we had a five that's game right spring season and uh had a we had a four and one year i actually had a really good season statistically as far as uh on offense scoring touchdowns and running the ball and i felt a lot a lot better and healthier than good than the year before. well that's good and so brennan you go to you go to bigs and you do the quarterbacking there What was it like, you know, I watched you guys, both of you, over the years, and it seems like that position, in my opinion, uh, is really tough because I always see, have seen, both of you telling everybody else where to line up. Yeah, it it can be tough because, especially at a a smaller school, you're not dealing with kids all the time that have played football all through since seventh grade. Sure. Seventh, uh, seven-year-old, right? Uh, you're dealing with a bunch of kids that may be their first time playing in high school, so you got to, as a quarterback anyways, even if you have a team of studs who all know what they're doing, you have to know every play, you have to know what every person is doing, and you have to know how it's going to uh, happen versus a, any kind of defense that comes up. And obviously it's a little more primitive when you're in high school or depending on the kind of high school you go to, um, how much you're going to be reading a defense and stuff, but... Uh, you really, as a quarterback, it's as much of a mental game as it is a physical game because you have to be knowing what your team is doing at all times, but more than anything, you have to know what the defense is going to do yeah. depending on what you play you run. Cameron, did you have that same issue at Gridley when you had uh, the, the, you know, you're basically the, the coach on the field when you're in that position. Did you feel like, the, you know, like you, you were kind of uh, telling everybody kind of what to do and, and, and setting them in the right spots and things like that? Yeah, there's definitely uh, there's definitely some certain there's obviously the guys that uh, that know don't it like to say much to it all and that they that really get it. But there's also some who you have to put them in the right position and you have to make sure that they know t- to do the right thing because if you put your running back on on the side and he doesn't know that he's blocking that guy come yeah come and you're gonna have a free rusher in your face and so yeah that's that's also the difficulty is like trusting the other guys to that they know what to do if you don't tell them what to do well that's that's kind of what i've always um recognized when i'm watching from the field you know i'm I'm always seeing the quarterback taking the running back and moving him to the spot where he should be or 
telling the guy to get off the line or get on the line or whatever the you know the play that's coming up. So it's yeah. it's 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 a monster in my opinion uh, of responsibility that uh, you have to have in that position that I don't think any other position even compares to uh, uh, from what I've seen. Agree? I, yeah, I, I would totally agree. A lot of people when you're watching like NFL or some of the best quarterbacks in college or NFL football. Um, they just see the throws. They see the athletic plays they're running. You know, Lamar is an outstanding athlete, and he runs the ball very well as well as throwing it. Um, but what they don't see is all the mind games that are going on inside their head. And when you get higher and higher in football, just the amount of thinking mm-hmm. a quarterback has to do at each uh, level, increasing level, yeah. it, it's insane. The average player probably couldn't do it without a lot of training it's a very difficult thing on to just have all that stuff going on in your mind before a play well Cameron when you were in youth football um I'll tell you a little story about Brendan that I because I was actually coaching the time I was just an assistant helping his team but we had a situation where we were trying to find who was going to be the quarterback and we had where the 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 offensive coordinator says okay I'm going to tell you a play and I want you to tell the play back to the huddle and run it correctly. And I remember just standing back watching this whole thing unfold. And I don't know if this happened to you, but it was kind of comical or to me because he would tell Brennan the play. Brennan would tell the, the kids in the huddle like you do as a quarterback. And then they would go to the line and execute the play. And it was between him and another guy. And they were going back and forth and they were trying to decide who was going to be the quarterback. I'm not just that only thing, but that was a obviously that's a big part, right? In youth football, if you can't tell yeah. the play right, right, it's kind of pointless. And so they were going through this back and forth, and after about the third time that the guys huddled up and the other guy came in, he looked up at the offensive coordinator and said, "I can't do this." And I, and I was like, "What?" He goes, "I can't do this. I can't tell everybody where to go. I can't tell everybody what to do. I can't tell them. I, I can't remember half the play." Did that kind of did you feel like that when you were starting out at, at the youth sports? Like, you know, you had way more responsibility, it seemed like, than the linemen. Even though I know the linemen are super important because I was one myself, but you had to have that knowledge of, you know, I knew what I was doing on the line, but I didn't know what Joe Blow behind me was doing as a running back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know uh if I really like felt like that was uh i don't know what i'm trying to say i don't feel like i don't know if i struggled with that but it is it was definitely like knowing that you have to remember what to say especially if it's a long play or something and to say it right to everybody and make sure that they're also lining up in the right spots and that they know what's going on yeah it's definitely well because especially in youth football so many of the kids are just out there and they don't really know what they're doing or what they're supposed to do. That's right. And it's, again, it's kind of kind of frustrating. I'm sure for both of you Yeah. when you have a bunch of kids like that, who don't really know what they're doing and don't, to be honest, a lot of them don't even care. They just want the Jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. time. You know, so you go yeah. from, from youth football to high school. And now every time you go up a level, it's faster pace, correct? Yeah, just just slightly. Um, I feel like in my head, whenever I go up a level from JV, varsity, Pop Warner to JV, I'd always think that the jump was going to be huge. But then once you get in there, you kind of notice that it's not a huge jump. I, at least that was my experience. Like it was still you noticed it, but it wasn't as as gaping of a gap that you had to jump. From what about you, yeah, Cam? I feel like yeah. If anything, I feel like it feels like a really big jump at first. Like, and I feel like, especially from high school to college, it felt like a really big jump the first like month or so. And okay. then after that, kind of started to feel more like, oh, this isn't really that much different. Mm-hmm. These guys aren't that much better. Yeah. So when you, when you finally start gelling with a the team, then you start getting that feel like you had when you were in high school, I guess. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you yeah, go, yeah. So, so you go there to, from high school and you go to college. What is the jump like? And I know you just said it wasn't that big, but when you first went there, um, I'm going to take this one at a time so you can explain. But, Brennan, tell me what it was like when you went. And first of all, I need you to tell me where you go, where you go from high school and then 
going that route. So go ahead. Um, so right out of high school, um, at last minute, kind of, I went over to a school, a Division three school in Virginia called Southern Virginia University. Um, played there for a couple years, and then after that, finished up at Missouri Western State University, which is a D2 in Missouri. Okay. So when you were at Southern Virginia, that was immediately after high school. What was that like? Um, it was a little, I guess it's kind of intimidating because I showed up. I really didn't know a lot about the university, never went and visited it. It was really last minute that I was going there. Um, but I showed up. I remember seeing all the guys on my team. And of course, uh, when you first get there, uh, it's a little intimidating. You see all the, these huge like Samoan guys, a yeah. bunch of dudes who, I mean, you can tell like they are like football, like college football athletes, like ready to go. Um, so when I first got there, it was a little intimidating more than anything, you know, and we were going on the practice field. I saw, oh yeah, some of these guys are pretty good. And, uh, it took a little bit of getting used to. Um, so more than anything, when I first showed up, it was a little bit of intimidation and me, I was going in as a quarterback. Um, and so for me, I showed up and in that locker room, when we first showed up and had our tryouts and stuff, I was one of seven quarterbacks at that time. One of seven, one of seven. Uh, and we were implementing a new offense. So when I first got there, I was really kind of thrown for a loop. And in my head, I was kind of like, I don't know if I can do this because just at that point I hadn't had so much confidence. You know, I wasn't sure about what I was doing. And so I showed up and it was more than anything intimidation that I kind of felt. But then once we started getting into practice and we started uh, going over things more and more, that's when kind of like what Cameron said, at first it was a little bit faster paced, but then once I got up to the speed and I realized, you know, this isn't really that big a deal that's when I started playing a little bit better. And I started noticing that, Hey, these guys really aren't that much better than what I am. I'm not, there's your few standout kids that you'll play against that you can tell they're better than you. But most of the people you play against, you're just like, Oh, it's just like high school 2.0. It's just the best kids from high school. And you realize, Oh, I can play with the best kids from high schools around. The gotcha. World. Yeah. What was it like for you, Cam, to walk on to that college, uh, practice at the first you know when you first got to college and you figured out this is kind of what I want to do what was it like for you uh for me it was it was definitely very intimidating when I first uh started with the summer practices at Butte it was kind of like not everyone was back it was still kind of more just like working out and uh a little bit of running and then once we got into like fall camp uh of last year my my red shirt year um it was just like, it was very, the first few practices, I was very intimidated. I felt like I was one of the smaller safeties to start off. And everyone, all a bunch of these other safeties were 20, 21 years old that have been there for two years. And every, I just felt like everyone was like a lot better than me right off the start. And so it was really like, really intimidating for the first while, especially with the mentals as far as going from like, in high school defenses run man or they run like cover three sure and now three weeks end of our fall camp we have like eight different um <laughs> coverage stuff we can run and 70 different coverages that there are and it's and it was just really really uh intimidating trying to learn all that and trying to be confident executing it when you're already going against these like good athletes now cam when you went into college brennan you went in and you proclaimed to be a quarterback uh, yeah, I went in as a quarterback. That was my plan. Uh, got there, and uh, I, like I said, I was intimidated. I was one of seven quarterbacks, and I was the last on the list there because I had like no experience or anything. And I actually went to the coach and told the coach, hey, I think I want to switch to receiver. And so I did that for the first week or two, and I was feeling pretty good about that. I was like, you know what? I feel comfortable here. It's all going good. But then the coach came to me, the head coach came to me during practice one day, and he said, hey, um, would you think about playing quarterback again? And I was like, uh, sure. Like if it was, if I was needed, I'll go wherever I need to go. And that's when he said, yeah, we're going to need you to come at quarterback. And then from that point on the rest of the season, I was the backup quarterback. So I want to, I want to stress that point to the listeners. Um, and I'm sure Cameron, you would agree with this. When a coach comes to you and says, Hey, we need you to do this. I mean, I assume that would be your answer too. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Right. If, uh... If he, if he needs to, uh, if they ask you to do something or say that they want you to do that, then that's definitely, yeah. definitely the answer. And th that, that to me, you know, when you went to Southern Virginia, you know, you had played quarterback and that's what you, and, and, but I want to get across to the listeners. A lot of times you go into from high school to wherever, and I know you got a lot of kids on your 
squad that your dad was telling me at the game the other day, Cameron, that, you know, used to be quarterbacks and now they're this or now they're that. So it's really important for people to understand that, that when you go from high school to college, you're, if you want to see the field, right, you're going to play where they tell you. Oh yeah, they're definitely. And if they feel that there's a better spot for you, whether that's switching you from one side of the ball to the other, yeah, then at least try it. If they think that's, that's the best, the best thing there's been multiple guys that have been asked to play like go from receiver to corner or from o-line to d-line and just to do different stuff because they have a better chance there yeah play. now when 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 you got to to your college cameron did yeah. you say what you wanted to do or how did you get to that safety secondary area well um originally when when I was in my senior year, towards the very end of my senior year, um, Coach Hayes, the offensive coordinator, uh, texted me and asked me to call him when I had a chance. And so I was, uh, I called him and talked to him on the phone for a little bit. And he said that he wanted me to come, like, watch a practice. And uh, and he said, and I went out and watched a practice. And when I was there, he was talking to me and he was like, um, just wanted to let you know, by the way, like, we're, we're recruiting you as, like, a DB. Like, we, will, we think you could make a good safety. Okay. And so then I already kind of expected when I talked to him on the phone that I was that I was going to play defense. Um, okay. And so I knew from then, like he even told me, he's like, yeah, like we're not really interested in you to come play quarterback. We want you to come play safety. Gotcha. And so, I, so I knew going there in the summer, like, like, oh, OK, I'm trying to I'm trying to be a safety. That's what you wanted. To, that's what they wanted you to do. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, Brennan, your your experience with. SVU, like you said, you didn't really even know. You wouldn't even think about it, right? You were thinking about going to Boise. Mm -hmm. That was my original plan. And that's another thing I wanted to tell the kids out there. You know, in your case, Brennan, you wanted to go where college football was was really big. Yeah. And Boise was huge. Yeah, like most kids, I'd think you'd want to go where big college football is going to take place. Yeah, but you started to – and then so you go to a camp at BYU in the summer. Mm Mm-hmm. And you just happen to run into the SVU coach who happened to see you play in that position. Yeah, that that's basically the whole way that I was able to get in contact with them because I was going to go, I had all my stuff. I was going to go and walk on at Boise State and I'd contacted the coaches and stuff. But uh, about a month before I was set to go out there, I had my dorm and everything. They cut their roster. They, they closed off their roster. They'd had a full roster and they told me that you can try again next year. So me just wanting to play football immediately, I decided, okay, I'm going to go elsewhere. Um, so that's when I found that I remembered that coach that had contacted me the summer before and I called them. I said, Hey, do you guys have any opportunity? And they said, yeah, come on out. You can come out and walk so the team. That, I think that's critical to kids nowadays. Cause all we see right on TV is LSU, Alabama, mm-hmm. Tennessee, all of these schools that are, it would be, <laughs> it would be a dream to play for. We all agree with that. But the reality is that's probably not going to happen. It didn't even happen for Aaron Rodgers, for crying out loud. Well, yeah, and and the thing that's important to remember about that is, you know, those kind of things, they're still possible if you go to a small school first. A lot of kids think that, you know, going to a small school right out of high school is a bad thing and you're just not going to have a chance to play big. But uh, you get noticed really easily if you play good ball at, you know, a small university, a junior college, D3, D2. Um, Because there are people that will be looking for you. And if you can prove yourself at the college level, there's no reason you can't play at a Division One. So That's right. And Cameron, yeah. and you're, you you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. I feel like um, whether whether you're at a junior college or a Division Two or three, if you're really, like, performing and, and, and showing that you're really good, like, there's really good D2 and D3 guys all the time that get to – move up and go to these really big schools because they've already dominated the competition below them. Yeah. I mean, that that's what I'm thinking is you have the opportunity. And, and nowadays versus when I was in school, you had to go to a big school to get noticed. Yeah, You didn't have the internet. You didn't have YouTube. You didn't have all this stuff now at your disposal. NCSA, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, you know, the, the recruiting uh, thing that you belong to, Brennan, at one time where you could get yeah. your videos out there. You didn't have that. Mm-hmm. So now that you guys have that, and then you have schools that um, you can get that film out to to the bigger schools, you know, if you play well, you have an opportunity to go somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest thing that I see is is versus when I went. Now, it's obvious, though, and I just want to make this point, that 
the reason you two are playing college ball, it's got to be the genes on my side. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I never. I only played your position once, so I don't know. <laughs> I think you could take a little bit of credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so the we went over the positions, and now if you had your choice, Cameron, what position would you want to play? Uh, I would definitely play safety. I okay. think that. It was it was a really good choice for me, and I honestly wish I would have uh, tried to play safety in high school so I could have gotten even more used to it. Okay. And uh, yeah, I just think that it's definitely the best uh, spot where I had the best chance to play and where I'd have the best chance of playing like at the next level. Sounds good, Brennan. Uh, I would have to say quarterback. I always loved quarterback, but uh, only reason I stopped playing when I moved to a different university was because of injury to my elbow. And uh, at that point, I just thought, oh, well, you know, I switched to receiver. So I thought that would be a better opportunity for me to play. And I got a little bit of playing time and some little uh, scrimmages and games before I broke my ankle. But when looking back, I'm like, man, quarterback was just so much fun for me. I really enjoyed it. I felt like I was pretty good at it. Injury kind of like limited me from trying that again at my second call. You said injury on your elbow. What, are you talking about like tennis elbow? Yeah, essentially it was tendonitis. Uh, when I came my second year at Southern Virginia, I came back and I had uh, just developed. I hadn't thrown a whole lot because I went on a mission in Mexico, was there yeah. for a while, didn't get to throw the ball a whole lot. So I came back and in that spring and then summer fall camp kind of time, I developed this tendonitis where it's essentially like my elbow would just make my whole arm swell to like double the size and it would just throb. And it made just throwing like 10 yards down the field hurt every time I did it. So... I went to the coach and I was like, hey, uh, I think I got to like do something else. Like, I don't want to waste a year of my eligibility, so I want to play. So if I could switch to something else and play for a receiver or something, that'd be great. So they kept me as a backup quarterback for the first game or two of the season. Um, and then that's when I was able to switch to a receiver. But it kind of sucked because that year I was I was probably going to be the starting quarterback because the guy ahead of me hadn't started there one of the scrimmages he'd thrown like six picks in the game. Oh, that's great. But I had but I had that that tendonitis so I was just kind of kept off the field and it just never recovered. Um so that's what kind of made me switch to receiver and I was okay with it at the time. I really just wanted to get on the field, but looking back quarterback really was my well, favorite. Well, when you were there the first year, you said you were one of seven. Yeah. So how did that season go for you? Uh the, the whole Pretty much majority of the season, which is about 10 to 11 games in a smaller college team, uh, I held a clipboard for majority of it. Like I said, I was the backup quarterback. And if you're a quarterback, you may have seen them on the sideline. They hold the clipboard. I don't know how they do it nowadays, but when I was there, you had a clipboard with paper, and every play that our offense would run, I'd have to write down the play. So I'd be standing by the coaches. They would tell me what play was going to be ran. I'd write it down, and that way they had a script of every play that was ran throughout the game. So you went, so you went from seventh string to two. Yeah, to second string, and then uh, the last two games of the season, I believe, I started the last two. It, one of the games, our quarterback got like a headache, I think, <laughs> a migraine, and uh, I was able to go in, and then I started another game after that. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. That that kind of got me. I already knew I loved college football and I wanted to keep playing it, but that really got me into it because the game he decided to get a headache on was our rival, and it had like 3,000 people in the stands. <laughs> and, of course, they all hate you, and I've said this before to a lot of people, but even when you're in that environment, and I know it's not Tennessee, it's not Alabama or something, but even when you're in that environment and you have that many people just hating you and like you from all it. angles, it's so cool. Like it is insane. <laughs> it's so much fun. And we got killed that game. Like we got killed by like three, four touchdowns, but I'll never forget that. That was so awesome. So, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. And that reminds me kind of on uh, your game when we went and saw Cameron play on Saturday last week and there was a hefty crowd there and there were at times were pretty loud oh, yeah. when things would go on. And, and how does that make you feel, Cam, on the field? Does it get you jazzed up when you hear that? Um, I mean, not really, just because, I mean, we have a decent amount of people, but it's not like uh, no, yeah. it's, not like it's loud to where, uh, to where it's much different than, like, certain high school games. But um, Sure. But definitely just, like, just like the, our team in general, like both teams being so big and, our, and us, like, all being excited is definitely like 
Oh yeah, Definitely something to get juiced up for though. Now, Cam, on on, and this is your second year, correct? Yeah, uh, so, my second year. I redshirted last uh, fall, and so it's technically my freshman season. So you have three more years of eligibility after this, or two? Uh, yes, three more still. Three more still. Yeah. And are, I assume you're planning on playing the rest. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm definitely planning on playing the rest right now. Um, I'm just yeah. And, Do you have any thoughts of where to go after Butte? Um, I I really don't yet. I'm not sure. It honestly would depend on um what schools and what coaches are interested in me. Gotcha. And, uh, yeah, like after this season, sending out all of my film and stuff to schools and uh, yeah, just talking to coaches. But uh, if not, then I'll be here next fall. And after that, then I would probably be a mid season or mid uh. Yeah, mid season, not mid season, like mid uh semester transfer. So, Brandon, you went to Southern Virginia for two years, mm-hmm. and you swore to me there was no good looking chicks there. <laughs> no, that was my freshman year, but I didn't really. Yeah, he I... said, "Dad, there ain't nobody here." The first year you were there, and the second year you were there, you weren't there a month. Yeah, and I found my my th- soon to be after that wife. Okay. So. So you found her, and where did you go from there? So from there, uh, she had a connection. Her dad taught at this school called Missouri Western State University over in St. Joseph, Missouri. It's about a 30-minute drive from Kansas City. So uh, that kind of got us started down that path. And I knew when I went, I was like, I want to play football. So I got in contact with the head coach and uh, some other coach. He was the recruiting coordinator there. He's not there any longer, but... I got in contact with them and I told them I knew I wasn't going to get a scholarship because that year that I switched to receiver because of my injury, I didn't really get a lot of playing time. Sure. I got mostly on special teams and I went at receiver very little. So uh, I told them, I was like, hey, can I come in and just join the team, walk onto the team? And they said, yeah, you can walk onto the team. Uh, you just got to show us that you can play ball, that you show up to every meeting, you show up to every workout and uh, everything on time. Now, before we get too far ahead, your second year at Southern Virginia – you had the injury to your arm, so you couldn't play quarterback. You switched to receiver, but then you got on special teams. Yeah, special teams offered me a good opportunity because, you know, you think I was a decent athlete at the time. Like I said, when I went to Mexico, I lost a lot of my speed and stuff. So uh, Too many carnitas. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> so when I came back, I also come in, came, came kind of in the same situation as my freshman year where I got into the receiver room. Well, there were 20 other receivers in that room, and they all were getting some playing time already. They were all decent. So I knew I was going to get little playing time, and it was a senior-heavy class that I was playing with that year. So uh, I kind of looked to special teams, and by the end of the year, I was playing on every special teams unit we had. So you started on one, and the next thing is two, the next thing is three. Yeah. So you just move around. And so you're on the field quite a bit when you think about punts, kicks, yeah, you, all that stuff. When you're on every special teams, you actually get a lot more time on the field than you'd think. I mean, unless either the team's scoring a bunch on you or you're yeah. scoring a bunch on them, you're getting on the field somehow. So. <laughs> so so, so it's important, like we were talking earlier before, you do, if you really want to play ball, you do whatever you have to to get on the field. Yeah, and any kid that's listening, like if you want to get on the field and like you're trying to find your spot on the team, coaches will love, like the hardest working kids a lot of times get put on special teams because they're just, you know, they get put on there because all they're trying to do is get on that field and play, and they love kids that are willing to play special teams. Because there's a lot of guys, you know, when you get up and you start playing, uh, you're a starting on offense or defense. A lot of guys, you know, they kind of sit back and they don't want to be on special teams. So coaches are always looking for dudes to get on the special teams unit that actually want to be there. So if you can, if you're looking for a spot on the team and trying to make it onto the travel bus or whatever, special teams is a good way to go. And yeah, my coaches are definitely uh, always talking about how good of an opportunity special teams is just to, like, get on the bus and be able to go to the games, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a humongous uh, thing. You know, everybody, they don't think about special teams, for the most part, unless you're Devin Hester with Chicago back in the yeah, day. I exactly. mean, that, you know, you got a lot of special teams action with that. But most kids don't think about that, and they think it's just a play, and, and you know, that's not really playing. But it is because it can be serious. But I will tell all the kids out there, if you're on kickoff, 
Make sure your head's on a swivel, right, Brandon? Yeah, lucky. Uh, <laughs> blindside blocks are illegal now, so it's not as big a deal. You can. I saw free. you get rocked. Yeah, yeah. No, back there. Well, and that was kind of a shock for me too, because when I was in high school and growing up, blindside blocks were the best blocks in football. I remember I came back, and uh, it happened to me, and I also did it to someone. And yeah. someone told me mid-season that, like, hey, that's illegal, you know. I luckily got away with it. The guy who did it to me didn't, but I was like, <laughs> that was a shock to me because I was like, oh, I thought this is still legal. So, but no, luckily you can kind of be a little more free with it now. <laughs> yeah, that was a brutal one. Actually, we went back there to watch you play, and uh, it was in Washington, that, that game, I believe. DC, I think. I it think was in it was, DC. Yeah. <laughs> and man alive your mother was screaming from the stands that's not right that's, that's the first that's the first time she was right about that too <laughs> usually she just says it because but that actually was a penalty that's so. unnecessary yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so you have these these college football opportunities and from what i'm gathering from both of you is you do not want to pass up if a coach hits you up about playing a position that you may not be super fond of but I think it opens the door for you to get to where you maybe want to be. Oh, yeah. If you're a coachable kid. Yeah, I think yeah. so. It, it, coaches give you a lot of help, and they they know a lot more than sometimes we like to give them credit. You know, like they know where kids can excel because they've been doing this at the college level. So uh, being open to them and their suggestions of where you should play, you never know. You know, like Cameron's there playing great at Butte College, and now he sees he loves safety. You know, a lot of kids, they get put in a position at first, they may not like it, but then they kind of find out that they can excel there. So all being open to where you want to go, to where the coaches want to put you, that's always a good thing because if it doesn't work out, at least you can say you gave it your best shot and the coaches will recognize that. Yeah. yeah. And if they're recommending uh, you to do, play a certain position, they obviously see some sort of potential in you doing that. Yeah, and they, they, and they, they may see you yeah. having potential to get on the field. That might be their way. They, yeah. may wa they may want you on the field right now, but the position you're at doesn't give you that opportunity. So they might want to put you on the opposite side of the ball where you can be on the field. So so I'm going to ask you, too, what, what is the coaching like from high school to college? And, and, and if you can tell us what's that what that's like, because... Um, I know when you go to a college, uh, most of the time you got way more coaches than you had in high school. Yeah. So what I noticed is just, well, if you go to a small school, you know, me and Cameron both went to small schools. I had a coaching staff who, you know, they weren't full-time coaches and that's kind of what happens at small schools. You know, you have coaches who are there to, to do the job and they do a good job. But uh, you don't have this specific, like when you get to college, you'll have a quarterback's coach. You'll have specific coaches for a defensive back, specific for linemen, for some defensive linemen. You have a coach for everything. And then with those coaches, you'll even have GAs or other assistants that help with those guys. So, and, and all those coaches are coaches full time. It's not really like at high school where a coach might be a teacher and a coach of full time. It's usually they are a head coach or an assistant coach full time. So they get to focus on that training all day. They have meetings. They study film all the time. And they also have assistants. Uh, I had an assistant at a Missouri Western who had just got through playing and coaching at Washington State for receivers. So he had a lot of experience. And now he was just doing this full time. So that's kind of the difference, uh, at least going from small school. I don't know the bigger schools how it is. I'm sure it's a little closer to how college is. But at the small school level, you know, you have coaches that they're doing the best they can, but it's not their full time job. And when they don't have as many coaches as you could have at college level. Do you notice that too, Cam at Butte? Yeah, definitely. And kind of with that too is like when you're watching like film as like as a team in high school and stuff, it's you're there's only a couple coaches so you can only really watch like everyone watches the same thing mm -hmm. and yeah. it's a lot well, a lot less like detailed as far as position wise and like you might go over a few plays but like in college it's like every single day you have a meeting with your position coaches and group and you watch your guys's stuff every day yeah. so it's more detailed in every snap like every snap of practice is watched multiple times and stuff and so all the like little details start to come out and you there's more stuff to work on and more stuff to fix and more stuff you have to know and like be correct in mm -hmm. so it's like really a uh, scrutinized your position they don't watch the whole film they see what did you do at this play or what should you have done type of thing yeah yeah uh, yeah and as far as uh, yeah grading it and like after the games getting graded on like whether you did your assignment if you're in the right spot Mm -hmm. and it's like on saturday when you were illegal substituted 
Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're going, over, going over that in film like five times. <laughs> Which it wasn't your fault, but it looked like it on the field. Um, the coaching uh, is so. From what I'm gathering, from what you two are telling me, it's it's just a little bit more detailed and refined at the college level versus a high school level. Yeah, mainly because there's just more resources, you know. Yeah. A college is going to dedicate more money and salary to coaches and guys who can do it full time, whereas at a small high school, you know, a coach here or at anywhere a small high school probably is just getting paid a small amount to come and fill the role. And it's mainly just like their own uh, volunteer hours and their own passion putting into it. But they might not have all the resources available like a college does. Sure. Uh, yeah. Is that what you think too, Cam? Yeah, totally. It, it really surprised me like when we got our first uh, like our first scouting report, just how detailed everything was. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, wow, like, like they, there was really like so many hours spent on like every single formation and yeah. play that they've ran and what percentage of that like the statistics a total plays out of that formation it is yeah totally and it just it's just a lot it was a lot so brennan you've been at two colleges now and can you tell us the difference in as far as time with practicing at those colleges and then i'll go to camp so the d3 school uh i don't know if the rules are still the same but when we were there you couldn't be there uh, all year or like in the summer doing stuff so I was a little bit closer to high school. That wasn't too bad of a change. You still had stuff in the spring and whatnot, but uh, you didn't have to be there in the in the summer. A lot of the winter, you didn't have to be there. Um, but then when I moved to the D2 school, those rules were not a part of it. And uh, we really only had, at Missouri Western, about maybe a month free in the year. All the rest of the weeks were dedicated to something football-related. In the off-season, you're doing workouts, and the summer workouts, and obviously in the fall, you got season going on. So it, it when I got to D two, that's when I really noticed uh, big bigger college football. It's it's basically is a full time job. You can get a little job if you want, but you have to dedicate a lot of time to meetings, workouts, practices, um, and then also if you're a freshman study hall. Um, th- there's a lot of time that had to be put in at least at the school that I went to, and it, it was a big dedication because you didn't really have a lot of time to go and get a job or a lot of free time to yourself. What, what What's a typical day like at a, at that school? Um, well, what day do you want to see? Season, off season? Well, give us, give us, give us something to go on here. Like I know you would tell me, you know, early and then late. Uh, like what, what do you, what so do you got? I'll do the off season at Missouri Western. We'd have, um, every day, pretty much Monday through Friday, it would be five it would switch between 5 30 and 4 30 a.m workouts for about an hour and a half two hours which is like agility or something then right at, then after that uh if you're a freshman or a new incomer you had to do go and do study hall um and then after that you'd have school of course if you have your classes you have your schedule where you need to go then after that you'd have practice um and then it depended on the off season you sometimes would have weightlifting before that practice because the morning might not have been weightlifting. Sometimes they couple it and have the 4.30 a.m. workout right after you do weightlifting, but uh, sometimes they wouldn't. But most of the time in the afternoon, we'd have practice. Um, but right before practice, we would have about an hour and a half to two hours of film from the practice before that. And uh, So they're filming your practices. Yeah, every practice is filmed from multiple angles. And uh, so that was a basic day, and that kind of went off and on. They'd also have this thing called Griff Games, which were these competitions where we'd draft each other on a, on the team. We'd take draft picks of, of players, and then we'd go out there, and the coaches would set up agility stuff, which is basically just the coaches just run you until you puke. That, that's essentially what the games were. <laughs> you're flipping tires, you're pushing sleds all for, like, minutes at a time. Um, so that was the off season, but then it can vary in this, in this fall during fall camp, you were at the school from 6 AM until nine at night doing either meetings, weightlifting or practice. And it was, it was just, you were there all day. You even had your meals there. So there were times there where I'd leave at 6 AM. I wouldn't get back until like nine, nine thirty. And so you come home and then what do you do when you get home? Um, it depended. Most of the time you're really tired. If you get home really late, you basically just maybe eat something and then go to bed go to bed <laughs> yeah because you 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 find like you sleep really good during when you're in college football because i mean like you're just your body you're always doing something each day yeah yeah mm-hmm. how about you cam uh yeah our our we get i feel like i feel like for the most part it's really busy during the uh the school semesters like 
during the summer. If you're a local guy, you have to be there for most of the summer at least, but uh, most of the guys that are out of state and stuff will go back for the summer. Um, and then, like, the winter break, like, we get it after the season's over, we get, like, a five- or six-week break until January until we start again. But um, besides that, like, our camp was – we, we didn't have to be there that late. It was more like um, every day except Sundays, it was like 8 a.m. to like maybe 3, 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. And so those days were still super long and mm-hmm. they're terrible. Like you basically get home, uh, make some food and stuff, and then just lay in bed until, yeah. until you fall asleep and do it all the next day. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I feel like um, in the spring – in the off season, it's definitely a little less, a less time than we do now. As far as like watching, like having meetings every single day and practicing every single day. So but, uh, we would still do like workouts in the morning, lifting in the morning, and then uh, do a team like a run as a team at like three. So it sounds like what you're telling me is it's to me it sounds like pure hell to play college football. If you don't, if you don't love the process, then it can be. Um, but yeah, totally. I, I'll tell you, like when I was like moving to Missouri Western and also at Southern Virginia, I really didn't have much of a problem with it. I mean, obviously, when you're waking up early for a workout, no one in no one with a sane mindset <laughs> should like that. You know, it's not meant to be liked. But um, I remember I get over it pretty quick because just at that time I wanted to play. Um, as I got towards my last year and uh, then I broke my ankle and they still had me coming to like 6am workouts. That's when I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> so wait a minute, you broke your ankle when and how? Uh, so my senior season last year, I fall camp we were going through, which is basically a month long at the 6am to nine at night. Um, my whole fall camp, I was doing pretty good, but my ankle was bothering me the whole time. Um, and then the very first practice of our first uh, game week, so we were going to go to Oklahoma to play Central Oklahoma. Um, that first practice week, I was in practice. I caught a ball over the middle, and I went up. And uh, we weren't playing, we weren't tackling because a lot of times you just do uh, where you just pop pads and then wrap up and then let them go. But this one guy, he just came in. He didn't really see me. He ran into me, and my left foot planted. And I don't even know how it broke. It's just I, I planted and I got hit, and I like, kind of fell over it. And when I got up, I felt the burning right in the inside of my ankle. And so I went to the tent and I had them look at it. I went to bed thinking that I just sprained it. And then the next day, I, I didn't really sleep at all. I came to, to the training facility. They got me an x-ray and they find out that I broke my ankle. Um, didn't need surgery, but they were told me recovery is going to be about like 10 to 12 weeks. And then I'd have to be light, not weight bearing, yeah. but not very much weight bearing for like four weeks after that. So I mean, that's, that's your whole season. Right oh there. yeah. So that was first, I went through all of fall camp, the worst part of football, <laughs> college football to the, to get through it on the first game week, the first day I snapped it. And that was the end of my season. So, and that was pretty much the end of your fall college football career. That, that was the end of it. Yeah. That was the last year. So, uh, it kind of sucked. It, it wasn't uh, ideal obviously, but, um, it, it was still cool to just be able to be there. I got to go on the sidelines for a lot of the games and be with my teammates. Um, so that, that was fine, but you know, it didn't work out how I wanted, obviously, <laughs> but you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out. Football injuries are a part of football. They right? are. Now, Cameron, when you have, uh, this weight of college football on you, like you did Brennan, when you were playing, there's just not a lot of time for extra stuff, I guess. Is that right? Uh, no, definitely not. Uh, there, definitely during the week, I feel like even some days, like I'll get home from practice on like a Tuesday or a Wednesday when we go full pads, and I'm at the school usually from like eight to six on those days, mm-hmm. and I'll just come home and like even when I have homework, it's like it's difficult to, yeah. to not <laughs> like after after you get home, just go straight to sleep and mm-hmm. actually stay up and get stuff done just from being so exhausted. Yeah. It, it, I think that's what I want to get across to the kids that are thinking about this. Cause you know, and you know, as well as I do, you've heard this from people before. Yeah. I'm going to go on and play college ball after this. Well, I'm not sure that's such an obvious thing after hearing this show, if you know what I mean, because it's not yeah. as easy as just saying, Oh, I'm going to go on and play. Yeah. It, it, one thing that I want to tell, like a lot of kids that they're starting not to discourage them because Playing college football is so much fun. I mean, no matter what level you play at, the guy, the relationships you get to make with guys and just the memories you get to have. 
but um it is a commitment um it takes a lot of hard work obviously to get on the field to begin with but the the real thing that it takes is kind of humility you show up and you got to be ready to just not play your first year or maybe even your first two years but um you've got to be willing to um, you got to be dedicated because, like we said, there's a lot of days where you're going to be at the field, at the field, or at the school for many hours, and it's you know most kids are not going to want to do that unless you really love the sport. So you have to really find a love for the process of getting better because if you don't, then it's just going to be a nightmare. And those are a lot of times those are the kids that don't make it through because they just don't fall in love with that process. But if you can fall in love with that process of getting better, and it's not fun, it's monotonous and it blows most of the time, yeah. but. If you can fall in love with that, that's what kind of gets you through. So. Cam, you think the same? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I feel like my first fall camp last year, I just like the first few weeks just were like so miserable for me. And it was just so <laughs> difficult to just like to just like enjoy it and stuff. And like and too focused on like not messing up instead of like having fun and like playing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. compared to like now, like this season and stuff. It's just, it's a lot. Like, I'm enjoying every day, even during fall camp. Like, every day you're there, it's still fun, and you're still, you're spending time doing something that, that you like, even though, even though, or that you love, even though it's, it's so difficult. And, like, the mental, the mentals was probably, like, the, the hardest thing in general, just, like, trying to learn all this different stuff that you've never, never heard of before. Mm-hmm. And trying to, it makes sense when when you've never done that speaking a whole nother language is what it is yeah it really, really is. is you know when you have totally. to learn things that that they say and that you've never heard before it would be just like trying to speak another language for the first time it'd be difficult oh yeah uh, so what you i think we 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 hit on what you can ex- what, what people can expect mm-hmm. um so that they have a clear vision and I know that there are resources out there. I believe is it NCSA, Brandon? NCSA is what I. NCSA use, yeah. was one that, uh, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up online, where you can sign up and and you can have your film automatically sent out to coaches and people that uh, are in the business of uh, college football to get your yourself noticed. Um, you know, you obviously, uh, I think the biggest thing you got to take away from this is, uh, first of all, I'm totally impressed with both of you that you actually are actually playing the game versus just wearing a Jersey mm-hmm. and, and nothing against people that go out and don't get to wear a Jersey. I'm saying that you have the ability to do that, which is, um, I think is not an easy task these days, this days, mm-hmm. these days. <laughs> Uh, because it is not that easy to just to go play. They're not. They're not looking. I mean, when you go look at the Butte roster and Missouri Western and Southern Virginia roster, when I went there and saw those, there was freaking. It looked like a hundred plus guys standing there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know, for you to get on the field is a, is an amazing feat in any position, in my opinion. If you're going to play that game, mm-hmm. just my hats off to both of you for being able to accomplish that. Now, what I wanted to touch on, Cam, do you have anything else to add to that? Or do, or do you, Brennan, about it? Have we missed anything that we were going to talk about or that you wanted to say? Um, I, I would. I don't really have much more to say. I would just say to any of the kids, like, if you want to play college football, I would totally say go for it if that's a dream of yours. Even if you didn't have the best high school experience, like we said, you can get to college and ball out and you get weeded out and the, the kids who really work hard show out there. So uh, do your best yeah. to get to where you want to go. But um, if you don't make it to where you want to be right out of high school, go to a small school. And, you know, it's not impossible. Even if you wanted to stay at a smaller school, you know, there are options there. Where you can really ball out at smaller schools, too. It, college football really is an awesome experience. So if that's a dream that you have, don't think that just because you go to a small school or you didn't have a great high school experience that it's out of your reach. There are plenty of places that want kids who work hard. And if you're willing to put in the work, it, it's it's doable. Trust me, like. A lot of kids slip through the cracks who are really good players but just didn't get the chance in high school and college is where they show out. What about you, Cam? Yeah, definitely. I think, like, the only other really thing was kind of uh, on top of that, like, just because when you first start out, too, you can you can get a lot better than you naturally are when you come mm-hmm. in. Like, I feel like it's oh, so yeah. easy to take to the coaching you get in college and, and really improve a lot, and then after that you can – actually get on the field instead of getting discouraged with being the number 10 safety or the number whatever seven quarterback you know yeah mm-hmm. yeah 
it's proof right here. I'm talking to both of you that that you can get to that next level and probably get to where you want to be, if not where you want to be, at least on the field, which is that's what you want to be when you're going into that realm where, you know, both of you played quarterback in high school. That's the most sought after position in probably the entire world when you think about sports. And that's not an easy position just to say, oh, I'm going to be the quarterback. I mean, you know, there's a lot of metrics there that they have to um, measure for somebody to be in that position. And we all know how they slobber over those six foot four guys. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, definitely. yeah, there's a, there's multiple guys on my defense that, uh, that were all QBs in high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They just, they're, they were all the best athletes when they were in high school and played QB. And now, you know, Yep. They're just better off playing defense. That's right. Yep. And, and if they didn't love it, they wouldn't be there. Otherwise, you know, that's the whole mm -hmm. point. They, they, they learn to, to switch. You know, that's the, what I think is huge with you two. You know, the guy comes to you and tells you, Cam, hey, we're looking at DB for you or safety or whatever. Obviously not what you wanted with quarterback. Same with you, Brennan, mm -hmm. where you went there, and you know, and you want, they wanted you back at quarterback, but you wanted to play, so you mm -hmm. tried to go somewhere else yeah. on the field, which is what you should do. I had that same experience with with my our my youngest son Brady and I was talking to the head coach and I said, "Hey, how are things going?" and he told me, "Great." You know, he said, "But some of the players want to play this and that." And I said, "I'm going to tell you right now. If Brady ever tells you he ain't going to play something that you want him to play, you come talk to me cuz I'll <laughs> kick his rear end." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's that's just not the way I roll, you know, when I when I, and and I think that's huge is both of you probably can agree you have to be coachable, otherwise the coach gets gets a bad taste in his mouth right at right away. Yeah, and if you're coachable, then it can get open a lot of doors for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now I want to switch gears a touch bit, and I know that college football is in full swing. Yesterday we saw an unbelievable game with Alabama and Tennessee, and <laughs> Tennessee beat them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they carried the goalpost away. I don't know whatever happened to the goalpost, but it it's went, gone. It went in the river. I think <laughs> yeah, it went in the river. <laughs> yeah. Which makes no sense to me. But... I was curious how no one stopped them. No one stopped them. <laughs> I don't know how they got it out of the stadium. The damn thing's huge. <laughs> what kind of doors they got in that place? <laughs> Jeez. I would have thought they'd have took it out to the parking lot and cut it up and gave souvenirs to everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's what would have been the smarter thing to do. <laughs> anyway, uh, but... Can you tell us a little bit about who, what teams you follow and, and what, who do you think is doing well in that sport these days? Um, well, my favorite team is Oklahoma. They're not doing the best to have a new coaching staff uh, this year, so it's been kind of rough. But um, best teams in the country right now are um, – well, right now Georgia's number one, the reigning national champions. I mean, they are, they're phenomenal. I wouldn't be surprised if you see them in the national championship game again. Yeah, um, yeah. Ohio State – Right now, the AP poll is Ohio State number two. Tennessee, after that win, is number three. And Michigan's number four with Clemson and Alabama close behind them at Ooh. five and six. So uh, it's a pretty close race. That's how college football is every season. Um, me, personally, I've watched a good amount. I haven't watched much of Georgia. Only one game I've watched them actually in person. But I've seen the scores, and they blow out nearly everybody. Only team that was really close was Mizzou. And uh, so that I, they're probably going to be there at the end. Ohio State, again, another one of those. It really will come down to the end of the year when they play Michigan. If they're both yeah, undefeated, be that, that'd be a good game because Michigan looks pretty good, and that's kind of the one team that can stand in Ohio State's way. But with one loss, yeah. you might be able to get in. I don't know. Um, and then Tennessee is kind of a surprise. Um, Hen and Hooker, if, I, I didn't watch a lot of them last year, but their quarterback this year, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes up and draft uh, stock this year. He, he's been playing lights out this whole season. I think Alabama game is like one example of that. I think he threw for like five touchdowns. Yeah, um, he did have five touchdowns. Yeah, but I mean the thing, the thing, yeah, the thing with Tennessee that's tough though is uh, their their division. They're in the same. They're in the same SEC, but they're in the same division with uh, Georgia. So they have to fight against Georgia this year to get to the SEC championship game. So that's really tough because if they don't win against Georgia, then that could be the end of their national championship hopes right there. So, Cameron, are you a, a Georgia fan? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not really a Georgia fan. Um, but I do think it'd be it'll be interesting when Georgia plays Tennessee in a few weeks because if Georgia does beat Tennessee and goes to the SEC championship game, 
if they were to play Alabama in the SEC championship game and Alabama wins, then you have three SEC teams with one loss. Yeah. And Alabama is the conference champ. Exactly. So it really has a lot of playoff implications as far as who wins between Georgia and Tennessee. Because mm-hmm. most likely, if Tennessee wins and has a win against Georgia and Alabama, they'll probably make the playoff. Yeah. What about your favorite college team, Cam? Uh, I don't know. I'd probably say I'd pro- probably Boise State would be my favorite college team. But I mean, they're all right this year. But it's not really Deion Sanders' team. What, Florida State? <laughs> oh, <dear>. uh. <laughs> Prime time, baby. Yeah. But yeah, um, I'm excited to watch Michigan and Ohio State too. Michigan ran for what was it? I think it was 418 yards on Penn State. Yeah, which a lot of people yeah, thought that was going to be a closer game, and uh, yeah. they really ran away with it. So that's it why really it, it's looking close. like the Ohio State Michigan game, like it is every year, is going to be the Big Ten game of the year. So now, did yeah. you happen to see that Utes game the other night, Cameron? The, oh yeah, I saw. I did. I only watched like the last quarter of it live yeah and then i went back and watched the highlights and yeah it was crazy for utah to pull that off especially well that guy that's a quarterback for utes he looks like a 70s porn star but i don't know what his name (laughs) cam rising cam rising cam rising he's he's good yeah i i I don't know i was telling brennan i thought he was more like a like what's that guy for the jets zach zach wilson zach wilson never was really impressed with him at byu but um, obviously he's did well at the Jets. He beat freaking did he he played he beat Aaron yeah, Rodgers he beat, he beat Aaron this last Sunday. Yeah. Which yeah. is f- Tanner's ecstatic because he's a Jets fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, saw the Utes play. But the guy that was a quarterback for USC, he reminded me of Mark Sanchez. He looks like him. Oh. He had the helmet on anyway. Well, hey, Caleb look. Williams actually was Oklahoma's quarterback last year. And uh, Heisman, not a candidate Heisman finalist, anything, but he had Heisman hopes coming into this season, and he still might. Uh, he's in the Heisman he's watch still list. Like the top eight candidate or six candidate. Though. Yeah, and and he came over with Lincoln Riley from Oklahoma to USC, and uh, that's why USC's kind of had a resurgence this season. They've been kind of lackluster the past few years, and uh, with Lincoln Riley and then that quarterback, and he also brought a lot of other players over. Um, they've kind of had that resurgence, so. Pac-12 kind of got a little more interesting because Utah's been good for years. And Cam Rising, he's not like the flashiest player that you've ever seen, but he reminds me, uh, I'm going to get like crucified on here, but like he reminds me (laughs) kind of like the same aspect of like a Tom Brady in that he's not the flashiest dude, but he wins games. Like that's all he does. He's just, he's a competitor. So that that's what keeps them in the games and uh, but USC is very good. That was that was a good game. Really that any team could have won that game. Speaking of Brady Cameron, have we seen the end of Brady? Wow, I don't know. It's it's <laughs> I don't want to say yes at all, but they have looked rough and They have. Rough. I I'm I'm right with you on that. What do you think? It, it's rough. His play is not as good as I mean, it hasn't been as good as it's been in the past. Um I wouldn't. I, I don't know for sure. I never want to say he'll retire, but I wouldn't be totally surprised since he was already on the verge of it this last season. Um, I, but the thing is with the Bucks and stuff, I, with Brady at the helm, I can never count them out. No. I, I think that they'll be there right at the end, but I don't know how far they'll go because they offensively they look pretty rough. But you can never really count them out. No, it, you I've can't. Learned, I've learned that over the years. So you can't count that guy out. I don't know if you two. Well, Brennan, you were on a mission. I don't know if you remember that Super Bowl with them and the Falcons, Cameron. But that was unbelievable. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was probably the best game, best Super Bowl I've ever watched. Point blank. Mm-hmm. Even with my Cowboys winning, it had nothing to do <laughs> compared to that one. And that was an unbelievable feat. But, um. What do we think about Cooper Rush? Do you think, uh, oh. I, you know, people are saying today on the radio he 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 hit his ceiling yesterday, but I don't know. You know, Zach, Dak has never really impressed me to begin with, so I don't know what to say. Oh, I personally, I think Dak is the guy for us. The only problem, not with him, I think the problem that happened is if you look back to his rookie season, that's when he, like, did amazing, and him and Zeke just got in the league. Uh, they went on a big run of winning streak and they went into the playoffs. They lost to the Green Bay Packers. But if you look to that first season, they ran the ball with Zeke a ton. We had a good offensive line, which we still do. We have a good offensive line. But uh, they ran the ball a ton. And if you remember Dak, he was really doing a lot of play action passing, which is what we've seen with Cooper Rush these past few weeks. Uh, They've really utilized the play action pass. And 
Kellen Moore, our new offensive coordinator, not new. He's been there for a couple of years now. But he's now, I think, just trying to figure out, okay, this is what works. He saw that with Cooper Rush, running the ball a lot and passing the ball when necessary or you know, not relying on the pass so much can really win you games, especially when you got a defense like we have. Because with Dak, you know, these past few seasons, last season especially, we had the number one offense in the league. And Dak was throwing for an absurd amount of yards when he was in the game. Yeah. But the problem is that's hard to sustain, and it keeps your quarterback, you know, getting hurt more often if he's dropping back that many times and throwing yeah. the ball. No matter how many yards he's going to have, it puts you more at risk. Whereas when you have that solid balance in that run game like we have with Cooper Rush, that gets you winning games. And the thing that they're seeing now, I think, is that, hey, Dak is much more talented than Cooper Rush just physically, has more gifts than Cooper Rush. If they can just do that same thing that they've done with Cooper Rush but with Dak, you have more of an opportunity to excel because Cooper did yeah. great for what he was given. I mean, phenomenal should not have gotten us this far but he's kept us in uh playoff contention and uh but with Dak there you could have an opportunity to do even more on the offensive side of the ball which that with our defense would be astounding you agree with that assessment Cameron yeah definitely he's a uh, he's been a good game manager and they've been able to limit his role as far as just straight dropping back and passing which has been a good thing and they've ran the ball really well and when their defense is as good as it as good as it is this year you really, he really doesn't have to do a whole lot if they can just get put some good drives together and give him some good play action opportunities. He can, you know, they can get they can get enough points to where they don't really have to risk and throwing it thirty five times. Yeah. And, well, and I'm not impressed with the Eagles team now. I know they're the only unbeaten team, and everybody says they're the best right now, but I don't agree with it. Well, the thing with the Eagles is they probably have one of the deepest rosters. Just at every position, they have good players, and that's kind of the way that you get to the Super Bowl. But the problem, uh, the thing is, like, I think, the, honestly, even though the Cowboys lost, so you got to take the loss on the chin. Um, really, when you look back, I mean, Cooper Rush threw three picks. That's not going to win you many games in any against any team you play. Yeah. Um, so you oh. take those away, you know, they had the comeback coming on. Um, I, I got to give – Credit to the Eagles. They are a very good team. And more than anything, Jalen Hurts has come on and been a much better player than I think anyone expected. He's definitely solidified his role as the starter there. Um, but, uh, you know, the inexperience in the playoffs, you know, that could come into play. I know Cowboys or other teams don't have maybe as much experience either. But um, I, I think down the road, because I think the Cowboys play them like maybe right before Christmas, like Christmas Eve. Um, that could be an interesting game if Dak's healthy and the offense is clicking and then that defense keeps doing what it's doing. That could be interesting. And uh, I hate to say it, but, you know, the 49ers are good when they're on their – when they're playing the game that like they like to play it. I mean, they're a good team. They just kind of don't show up consistently. Um, the problem is the NFC is not super strong outside of Philadelphia, the Cowboys defense, and a few other teams. Uh, Minnesota's kind of there, but the Eagles already beat Minnesota. So the problem is – the NFC as a whole kind of has its struggles. Like the Rams, the Rams are in shambles right now, and I don't know what's going on over yeah, there. Yeah, that's really a shocker to me. So that's where the Eagles really have an advantage. It's kind of their their conference to lose because really besides the Cowboys and the Giants, who knows what they'll be able to do if they'll be able to keep this winning streak up. But uh, there's not a whole lot of teams that outright right now I'd look at and I'm like, oh, yeah, they could beat the Eagles in the NFC. AFC has a different story. I think the Bills personally – I would not be surprised. I think the Bills will be in the Super Bowl. Um, but, I mean, I think either the Bills or the Chiefs could give the Eagles fits. Yeah, what do you think of that, Cam? Uh, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. I think the NFC as a whole is not super great. And I was very critical of Jalen Hurts as far as, like, mm -hmm. if he can really throw the ball. But I think he has done a really good job this year and shown, like, that he's definitely a top quarterback. And, uh, yeah, I just think – it's, I'm really surprised that the NFC East has got like their best record by far of all the divisions. Mm -hmm. of <laughs> I know. Giants five and a one, which is crazy. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. It's looking like it's looking like the NFC could really be anybody that wins it this year out of those top top teams. Well, gentlemen, I uh, do you have anything else to add before we wrap this up? I don't. Uh, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you two enough for joining me on this show. And I, just to let the listeners know, we've surpassed the 2,000 downloads on the podcast. Now, this is also on both the podcast platform and on YouTube. 
on YouTube, it'll just be the audio, and I'll throw in some pictures with that if that's what you like to do, because everybody and their mother knows how to get on YouTube, but not everybody knows how to do a podcast, but the podcasts are really easy. They're on uh, Google, Amazon Music, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you want to get your podcast, you can find Front Row Chaos there. I do have a merchandise uh, line coming so that you can order a shirt or a hat and uh, they'll, they'll send it right to you, which is really cool. That's coming from my website here shortly. The lady is just finishing up the designs right now um, and then that'll be coming and I'll let you know when that happens. But it's just really cool to be able to interview both of you and talk about stuff like this that I don't think a lot of people have a clue about and... I'd like to get interesting stuff out there, and I and I and I think this did that. I think it was interesting and informative, which is what I try to do with every one of my shows. So thank you both for coming by, and uh, and doing the show with me. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for having me too. Hey, you guys have a great day, and we'll see you again on the next time on Front Row Chaos. Uh, uh.